Let's talk about the normality assumption that some analysis techniques and statistical tests make. Students who work on their master's theses often make a big deal about the normal distribution assumption. Also, some researchers who are in the beginning of their career may think the normal distribution is important. And this is not the case for most simple analysis. In most of the cases, if you do regression analysis or compare means or do something other, simple analysis, whether the variables are normally distributed or not, has very little relevance to which analysis technique you should pick and whether you can trust the results. Let's take a look at what the normal distribution is about and a couple of misconceptions about the normality assumption. So, some of the basics. Here is the normal distribution. So, this is from Wikipedia. The normal distribution is this familiar bell-shaped curve. It tells us that most of the observations are in the middle, around the mean. This blue normal distribution has a mean of zero. So, we can see that most observations are close to the mean one or plus or minus one standard deviation from the mean. And then we have some observations that might be very far from the mean, but they are very rare. So a normal distribution goes from minus infinity to plus infinity, but getting values that are more than maybe four or five standard deviations from the mean are very, it's not very common to, to, for that to occur. Normal distribution is not also, also not one distribution, but there are many normal distributions. Like this one is a bit wider. This Red one is a bit wider normal distribution. This green one is a bit wider and it has a different mean. So the normal distribution is defined by the mean and the standard deviation or variance. We call this also the location parameter, the mean, where is it located? And this person parameter, how wide or how flat the normal distribution is. Here's some data. So this is normal distribution uh, centered at mean uh, and standard deviation or variance is one. And this is a histogram of a sample from this normal distribution. So this is what normally distributed data might look like in reality. And we can see that uh, there are very few values that start with minus two. There are no values that start uh, with two. So most observations are plus or minus two standard deviations from the mean. And mostly they start with zero or minus zero. So that's close to the mean. And it's also important to understand what kind of variables can never be normal. So some examples of non-normal variables are categorical variables like gender. If we model it as a binary variable, zero men or man and one woman or male and female, depending on whether you talk about sex or gender and all limited dependent variables or all, all limited variables because normal distribution is from minus infinity to plus infinity. And if we have, let's say, income, which cannot be negative, we have percentages which are bound between zero and 100. In some cases, if we talk about fractions, those cannot be strictly speaking normally distributed because they have these, these bounds. They are, they are limited variables. Then uh, all discrete variables, because normal distribution is a continuous probability distribution, we can see that these variables here are des have decimals actually is around it to two, two digits and uh, school grades of one two three four five six seven eight nine elementary school in Finland has nine grades those are discrete variables so they are, they are ordered discrete variables they cannot be normal in practice uh, most of our data that we model cannot be normal but the question is that are the data normal enough and uh, is a potential violation of normality assumption severe enough to cause problems? The answer to this in at least 99% of cases where we do regression analysis or compare means is no, the data are sufficiently normal. Let's take a look at some examples of misconceptions about normal distribution and how it has been handled or presented in master theses. I used master's theses as examples in this video because master's theses normally explain the data exploration stage of the analysis in more detail than, for example, a journal article where the data exp exploration or exploratory analysis is often left out and just the final results are reported. 
My point is not to point out individual uh, errors in individual theses or to say that this our uh, students have some, done something incorrectly because they are just following what they're being told to do. But the point is to show that there are general misconceptions about what is the meaning of the normality assumption for statistical analysis in social research, for example. So let's take a look at this example. Uh, this uh, thesis says that all measures, measured parameters, the student probably means variables, were not normally distributed and sample sizes were relatively small. Therefore, statistical analysis was performed with non-parameter tests. So you are uh, choosing your test based on the distribution of the variable. This is uh, incorrect. The second example here is, um, this is a table from another master's thesis. And we have means here, so the m's are means. And the significance of the differences between means is tested with the man with the u test, which is a non-parametric test. The problem is that the man with the u test is not the test of mean differences. And then we have the, uh, the final misconception that I'm, I'm talking about in this video is that if your data are normal, particularly non normal, particularly if they are skewed, then you have to transform them using the log transformation. Or if, if, if you don't have to, at least in some way transforming the data to be more normal like would somehow make the analysis behave better. Then uh, we have the issue of rank correlation. Often students say that because their data are non-normal, they cannot apply the normal linear correlation, but they must apply the rank correlation. This also is, is incorrect because uh, the correlation that you pick should depend on the kind of relationship that you want to model, not on how the data are distributed individually. So this is a summary of three common misconceptions. If the variable is not normally distributed, non-parametric tests should be used. In reality, you should always pick the test based on what you're testing. And if you're testing differences between means, then you should generally use a t-test regardless of how the data are distributed. If the variable does not follow a normal distribution, it's a good idea to convert it with logarithm or some other transformation. This is also not true. Transformations are useful if you want to model nonlinear relationships, but again, this has very little to do with whether the data are normally distributed or not. Then, uh, if the variable is not normally distributed, a rank correlation should be used. Again, rank correlation models a different kind of relationship than the normal uh, linear correlation, and you pick the relationship based on how two variables vary together, not on how they are distributed individually. Now, we, we must ask, where do these misconceptions come from? Because students don't invent these uh, rules of thumb themselves. They come from some of the books that the students read and some of the courses that the students take. So, for example, uh, this uh, fairly popular book on statistical analysis by Tabanik and Fidel says that uh, normality is an assumption that is important to check and uh, statistics might give you misleading results if normality doesn't hold. That's not true in, in most cases. This book, uh, I give credit for the book for citing uh, some evidence for this claim. So I read the study by Bradley 1982 and that study doesn't actually provide any evidence, but they uh, cite an example of a study that shows that if your sample size is eight, then non-normality of data might be a problem for comparing means. If your sample size is minuscule, yes, there might be some problems, but in, in the sample sizes that we actually work with, normality is not a problem as we can see in, in a moment. Another example, this is Cooligan. This is used in, in, in some psychology departments as they are the research manual for master students. And, uh, it explicitly says that when skew is indeed more than twice the standard error, then you should either change to a non-parametric test or follow the procedures outlined in chapter 15. 
uh, whether you use a parametric or non-parametric test does not depend on the distribution of the variables. It depends on whether you're testing mean or whether you're testing median differences or it depends on some other purpose of the test, not on the distribution. I'm going to talk about uh, these three uh, misconceptions as two classes of issues. The first class or the first set of issues is, uh, or sort of the first application is testing differences in means or testing um, a parameter against zero like regression coefficient or testing if a variable's mean differs from zero. So either comparing two different groups or testing some parameter that we estimated from the data. And then I'm going to talk about how we analyze the dependency or relationship between the two variables. So let's get to testing means and normal distributions. Where does the idea that testing mean differences requires the variables to be normally distributed come from? I'm going to talk about this in the context of regression analysis because most good texts that I'm aware of talk about the normality assumption in the context of regression. And that is also most of the articles that I've seen that talk about the normality assumption that that's the context that they use. Regression analysis is just a more general way of analysis. So mean, testing a mean, testing two means and their difference is a special case of regression analysis where you have all the data in the dependent variable and then you have one independent variable which receives one or zero depending on which group the data originates from. Or if you want to test if a variable has a mean of zero, then you can just have that variable as a dependent variable, don't have any predictors in the regression analysis, include the intercept and check what is the p-value of the intercept that tests the difference against zero. It is equivalent to a t-test, just a more general framework. So regression analysis makes an assumption that we call the normality assumption. Now, this is something that most good regression books tell you and also most books that are not so good tell you. The difference between the good books and the not so good book ones is that uh, the good books like Woolrich's introductory econometrics here, it's one big book about regression basically, uh, it tells that we need the normality assumption to prove that regression estimates are normally distributed over repeated samples regardless of the sample size. So we need the normality assumption to prove that regression works well regardless of sample size. If the regression coefficients over repeated samples are normally distributed, then that means that we can actually apply the t-test for testing the significance of the regression coefficients. The book also tells us that we don't actually need the normality assumption always because in large samples, regression estimates are, are normally distributed. We call this asymptotic normality. So when sample size approaches infinity, then regression and coefficients will be normally distributed regardless of the sample size. Then the book uh, explains the theorem and then goes on and, and proves it. The important part here is that what this means is that normality is not an issue for regression and therefore not for mean comparisons either because they're a special case of regression as long as sample size is large enough. Now the important question is how much is large enough? Well we cannot prove like one rule of thumb that would say that let's say 50 or 100 observations is always enough for this to work but the book says that most econometricians tend to agree that 40 observations should be sufficient for most cases for normality assumptions to be completely irrelevant. And I was taught and I used to teach that regression analysis makes an assumption of normality and that that is something that should be tested after the analysis. So when I read this and I understood that regression analysis actually does not need the normality, it just needs a large enough sample size for that to be not the problem. I was thinking, okay, okay, so I've been, someone has been teaching this to me incorrectly and I've been teaching this incorrectly to my students. And then I started to think that, okay, so if normality, if non-normality is a problem for regression analysis, then I should be able to simulate the data set 
with severely non-normal data and analyze that data set and see some kind of problem. If regression analysis doesn't care about the normality, then uh, I should be able to should not be able to, to get it to not perform well in with applying weird distributions to the data. So what I started to do when I was starting preparing my, my next year's teaching on regression analysis for doctoral students, I, I tried to break regression analysis. So I started to simulate regression analysis um, and or data sets for regression analysis. So what I basically did is that I took a, a simulated sample of, let's say, maybe 50, I don't remember the sample size that I applied. I simulated the data from, from this kind of regression model. So the n here means normal distribution. So I use the normal distribution for the error term. And that produces uh, fully normal data because all the x's are normal. And I generated uh, 1000 samples from, from that model. And I analyzed each sample from, with regression analysis. And I looked at, okay, so are regression estimates normally distributed? And the regression estimates are, are here with black and the red here is the normal distribution. And I can't see it, I can't tell the difference. And this is expected because when the error term of regression analysis is normal, then we can mathematically prove that the regression estimates will be normally distributed over, large, over uh, different samples and that is required for the t-test. So can we break regression analysis? I tried really, really hard. I tried different distributions. I tried to have absolute value of normal distribution. So that's kind of like taking the, uh, the bell shape of normal distribution and then just um, taking the positive half, leaving out the negative half or, or flipping the negative to be positive. I took a uniform distribution from, from zero to one. I took uh, a chi-square distribution, which is highly skewed distribution with one degree of freedom. I took the chi-square with five degrees of freedom, which is skewed, but not less as much as the one degree of freedom. And what I discovered is that even in small samples, uh, the regression estimates were always normally distributed over repeated samples. So if they're normally distributed, then t-test would be appropriate. Okay, so, so what, do, what do I do next? Then I was thinking, okay, I need some more brain power. So I cannot figure, out, figure a way to break regression analysis. So I did this about uh, six years ago. And then there was this discussion about regression assumptions on this big email list of academic management research methods division. And I participated and I asked people to come up with an example for where regression fails simulate the data set where the, uh, the variables are not normally distributed and send me an example if you can show me a single case where non-normality of data is problematic for regression analysis I'll buy you a dinner. So uh, I offered anyone a dinner at their place of choice either in Uvascula or Helsinki which are places where I frequently I'm in Finland or a conference if we happen to go to the same place and I'll buy anyone who can show me a realistic example where regression analysis fails because of non-normality. I offered this to students so as to any student on my doctoral level course on quantitative analysis who presents me an example where regression is problematic because of non-normality it's a dinner for you. I've done this for years and no one has been able to show me a single case where regression analysis would actually run into the problem with non-normal data. If you don't believe my analysis, this is also something that has been analyzed in published research. So here's an article violating the normality assumption, maybe the lesser of two evils in our behavior research methods, which is pretty respectable research methods uh, journal. They tried to break regression analysis and they actually found some cases where regression analysis actually gave you misleading results when data were non-normal. So what was required was that one of the explanatory variables had to be severely non-normal and the dependent variable or the error term had to also be severely non-normal. But they also reported that this happened only if sample size was 10. When sample size was more than 10, they couldn't break regression analysis. 
So in professional researchers who really try to break regression analysis cannot break it with sample sizes of more than 10. That just shows us that mean comparisons, regression, uh, they are very robust against non-normality. Now let's take a look at the recommendation of using non-parametric tests to test uh, the differences between two groups. So we have group A here, they are the blue one, and group B here, the red one. B is normally distributed, A is highly skewed. These variables have the same mean. And if we test the mean difference, test the difference between the means of these two variables, then any valid test should in most of the cases give us a non-significant result. There is no differences between means of these two variables. If we uh, analyze this data with the two sample t-test, we'll have a non-significant result, which is the correct results. The means of these two distributions don't differ. But the Kruskal-Wallis, which is a non-parametric test that some people recommend in these scenarios and many master's students use in their thesis is when variables are non-normal, gives you an incorrect result. So the means of these two variables are not different. So how is it possible that this test gives us a highly statistically significant difference? The reason is that the, the Kruskal-Wallis and the man with new test, they don't test for differences in means, but they can be thought of more as differences in medians. And if we look at the medians, they are, the median of, of the blue variable A is less than the median of the red variable B. And, and this is what the test tells us. So if you are interested in means, then uh, the mean, the t-test is the right test. If you are interested in medians, then the Kruskal-Wallis or Manuity U, they are the correct test. So you always pick the test based on what is tested, not based on the distribution. And now the question is, uh, which of these two tests and should we apply? Should we use means or medians to compare these two groups? I would say that comparing these groups without discussing the differences in the distributions based on means or medians would be misleading. But if I would have to pick, and my research question would be, is a typical member of group A smaller or smaller number than a typical member of group A? The answer to that question would be yes. Typically, A's are smaller than B's because the bulk of the distribution of A is to the left of the bulk of the distribution of B, and that is what median quantifies. But even more, more informative would be to just analyze this data, this subgroup here, and these outliers, either take them out or actually split this data three ways. So we have actually three groups. So we have the low values of, of A and high values of A, and then we compare those against B. So I would, uh, not compare just mean or just median, I would split the data more and just explain how these two distributions differ instead of just looking at whether the means or medians are the same. So my rules of thumb and uh, related to testing mean differences. Pretty much always compare means if you are, are comparing two distributions. I cannot think of a scenario where starting with comparing means wouldn't be useful. Then, if you compare means, always test the uh, difference between the means with a t-distribution. T-distribution being a, a, a t-test, being a special case of regression analysis, is really robust against non-normality. If your sample size is 10 or more, you should generally have no problems using t-test regardless of how the data are distributed. If your sample size is less than 10, then a small sample size is a bigger problem generally than any distribution of the variables. Then, if the variables have very different distributions, also report the medians and test the difference between the medians with the Kruskal-Wallis test or the man with new test. You should also, if the distributions differ, significantly in their shape or if there's clear subgroups in the data, just analyze how and why the distributions might differ. 
if the samples are not independent of each other, so like if you have repeated measures, the same students measure them in the beginning of the school year, at the end of the school year, then you should apply the repeated measures versions of these tests. A common mistake is using the kruskal wallis test or the man with new test to test differences between medians. All right, so the misconceptions come from how we are teaching students and how this kind of research manuals are tell students to use statistical tests and pick them based on normality. This is incorrect. The difference between mean values should always be tested with a t-test regardless of the distribution. But the mean is not always the best statistic. So mean is highly, uh, it, it's affected strongly by extreme values. So if your data are not normal, if there's like a long tail or there is a secondary group far from the mean or sub, sub sample subpopulation far from the mean, then uh, reporting medians would be a better idea. If you compare medians, then you use rank tests, which uh, Man, Whitney, U and uh, Kruskal-Wallis tests are. So you don't do it like this. So you don't report mean or average and rank tests Instead, you do it like this, like this research article does. So when your data are skewed and if you want to quantify the data with a single number, then uh, that single number should be mean and a median. Of course, it would be even better if you have the space to, uh, to show the distributions and explain why the skewness exists. All right, let's move on to the second topic or the second area, which is there are analysis of the relationships between two variables. So normal distributions and dependency between two variables. Two variables, the easiest way to analyze the dependency between two variables is the correlation. So we need to talk, start by looking at what correlation quantifies. This is from Wikipedia and correlation describes or quantifies the rela linear relationship between two variables. So it basically says or answers the question of how well we can describe the data with a single line. And if we do so, what would be the direction of that line? So uh, correlation of one means that the data are fully on one line and the, the, uh, the line goes up. Correlation of minus one means that the data are fully on one line only and the line goes down. Correlation of zero means that there is no linear relationship between the variables and uh, Correlation of 0.8 is very strong correlation in social science is pretty much unheard of. And then 0.4 starts to be something that you see in play, with plain eye without statistical software in small samples. So correlation importantly doesn't tell us how, how much one variable increases as a function of another variable, it just tells us how linear the relationship is. This in the middle doesn't have a value because correlation does not exist for this variable. The reason is that correlation measures the covariation between two variables. And in this case, the y variable is constant. It's not a variable, it's a constant. So if, if it cannot, does not vary, it cannot covary and hence it can have a correlation. All these statistical relationships here have zero correlations. So even if we have a strong kind of like O shape uh, relationship here, it's not linear. So there is no re linear relationship. The relationship is something else and therefore the correlation is zero. Whether the variables are linearly uh, dependent or not, or how well a line describes the data, in other words, does not depend on the distribution of the variable. So we can see here that our x variable here is highly skewed. This is the, uh, the chi-square of one degree of freedom and the y variable is also highly skewed but the relationship between these two variables is perfectly linear. So if uh, x increases then y always increases by the same amount. So that's a linear relationship. So it's perfectly possible as this example shows is to have a case where severely non-normal variables would be really well explained with a linear relationship. Now, let's take a look at transformations. Transformations are often used in data preparation stage and uh, 
how, how it works in, in research practice is that you check the variables and if variables are skewed, then you apply log transformation to make them less skewed. And this is something that I'm pretty familiar with because I wrote a paper about it. So in this paper, I and, and two doctoral students from my, my research methods course, Aaron Henney and my longtime co-author Miguel, we took a look at articles from leading journals in management and we took a look at how these apply transformations to data and how they justify the transformations. We found a lot of problems and uh, then we, we generated, we created a few guidelines that researchers should follow. And this article was awarded the best quantitative paper for the year for organizational research methods for 2022. And it's now mandatory reading for many doctoral students in their doctoral programs. So if you are in a doctoral program, this is probably a good article for you to read before you start applying any transformations to your data. I'm using this article here because I want to use the examples. I'm not, not going to talk about the specific guidelines because some of them are a bit technical, but let's take a look at two examples that I present in the, in the paper. So the first example that we have is coin throws and tails. So the first variable is number of throws, how many times we uh, throw a coin. And then the second variable is how many times we have a tail from that throw. So uh, based on our understanding of how coins work, if it's a fair coin, then the number of tails should be approximately half of the number of throws because the tail comes up half of the time and head comes the other half. But these variables, uh, the throws is, is um, non-normal because I generated with, from uniform distribution between 0 and 100. And the tails is also non-normal. It's this weird peak on the right hand side. So it's even more non-normal than the throws. And now the question is that how should these uh, non-normal variables be characterized? Because this uh, is a skewed variable, should we log transform the variable? There is actually a rule of thumb that many management researchers apply, which states that because the number of tails is a count variable, we need to model it exponentially. And that is equivalent to taking a log transformation of, of or conceptually the same as taking a log transformation of the dependent variable. So uh, the question now is that if we transform the data, that is the same as taking modeling it exponentially, is the exponential curve or the line a better characterization of these data. Uh, the exponential model says that if we don't throw the, uh, the coin at all, we are going to get approximately eight tails. That's impossible. Then the exponential model shows tells us that if we throw the, uh, the coin 60 times, we're going to get about 20 tails. That doesn't sound right. And when we throw the coin a hundred times, then we'll get about a bit more than a hundred tails. It's not shown in the figure. Or is the line uh, a good uh, a characterization of the data? The line, of course, is a lot better here. And what this shows is that if you uh, transform your data, then you're actually modeling a nonlinear relationship between the explanatory variable and the dependent variable. So taking a log, uh, logarithm of the dependent variable, variable is uh, equivalent to modeling the relationship between the original dependent variable and the independent variable as with an exponential curve, which is clearly inappropriate in this case. So when should logarithm be used then? Log transformation should be used when it's meaningful to expect the relationship between the two variables to be non-linear and particularly of exponential form. So exponential form means that when variable increases, it always increases proportionally to the current value. And here's an example that we use in the paper. This is data from the Canadian census from 1970s. We have occupations, the observations, there are 102 observations. And uh, we have income, which is the annual income in Canadian dollars. And then we have the average years of education that the person who works in this occupation has. And we want to understand how education and income are related in Canadian, in the Canadian census data from the 70s. 
uh, we can see from the scatter plot that the relationship does not appear to be linear. So uh, first, when we get, get the basic education 12 years, the mean increase is only very gradually. So there's a little bit of increase in the average expected income. But then one, when you go to the secondary and education, higher education, we can see that the, the, the mean of the data starts to go up. And uh, the relationship is clearly nonlinear. We can see also if we hit the line here, the middle, middle part of the line over predicts. So there's lots of uh, very little observations here, much more here, and then it under predicts here for the higher education incomes. The exponential model, on the other hand, describes the data a bit better. So initially there is very little effect and then it starts to, to increase a bit. This is by no means the perfect uh, model for the data. You can actually get a lot better uh, prediction, but this just shows the difference between the, uh, using a log transformation and using a linear model. In this case, the log transformation also makes sense conceptually, because if you think about how people receive uh, salary increases, you always try to negotiate a salary increase that is proportional to your current income. So if you want to go to a better to uh, a new job, or if you think about whether you want to take uh, get one additional year of training to get a better job, you think about how much does it increase my income? Is it increase does it increase my income ten percent, twenty percent, or instead of thinking about absolute dollars? The, the reason for not thinking about absolute dollars is the marginal utility of money. So uh, the first dollar or first thousand dollars gets you a lot more than the second thousand dollars. And if you make uh, at ten thousand dollars per month, then if you uh, someone offers you rates of of one thousand from ten thousand to eleven thousand, then the difference is not that great anymore. So log transformation is useful for modeling this kind of nonlinear relationships but it's not needed for, for making any test behave well. Then we have the rank correlation. And uh, we need to understand what is the rank correlation or the Spearman correlation. Here's some data. This is synthetic, generated uh, with a computer. And no real data probably looks like this. But this is an example where the rank correlation of 0 0.33 and the linear correlation 0 0.44 are both somewhat substantial and of different side. So we would make a very different conclusion uh, about the, uh, the nature of the relationship based if we just look at these two numbers. And why is it, how is it possible that two correlations are so different? It's possible because the, uh, the Spearman correlation tells us whether x is increasing when y increases. So it tells us about the direction of change of x when y changes. And uh, this is a bit of a simplification. And for the most part of this plot, the, uh, the y actually increases when x increases. So uh, this 95% of the data, there's a clear increase in relationship. And then for this part of the data, that it, it's not enough to flip the correlation to be negative. The person correlation, the linear correlation, on the other hand, tells us how well a line describes the data. And if we draw the line, that's, that's the, the line, we can see that this is the best line explaining the data. And the line goes down because it has to explain both groups. If you want to understand a bit more on how the, uh, the rank correlation, the linear correlation are related and what the rank correlation actually does, Here's an explanation, a, a plot have, where we have the variables and the ranks, and then the scatter plot between the variables and the ranks and the correlation. So um, x is originally uh, uniformly distributed and roughly, and when we convert it to ranks, it's also uniformly distributed. So there's pretty much no correlation. And uh, the ranks, by the way, are from 0 to 300 because we have three. 300 observations or 1 to 300 because we have 300 observations in the data. So the rank just puts the variables into the order in, in order and tells how uh, far from, from, the, from the first observation they are, from the, the smallest observation each value is, is on that rank order. And uh, then uh, the, the, the rank transformation of y is more interesting. So we can see here 
that the rank transformation actually brings these extreme cases closer to the uh, other observations. So if we have most of the observations that are between, let's say, 1 and 0, and uh, 0 and 1, and then we have one observation that is 1000, the 1000 is going to uh, affect a lot any linear description of the data, but it doesn't really affect any rank description because it's going to be the, the largest value regardless. So how large the largest values are or how extreme the outliers are is not really affecting the rank correlation, but it affects uh, the linear correlation. So which one of these should we use, the rank correlation or the linear correlation with these data? My answer to this question is that if your data looks like that, so you have x and y here, here, this one, and you should not try to characterize the relationship between those two variables with either of these correlations. Instead, you should be looking at the scatter plot that we have here, including that in that in your article or your, style, your thesis. Say that it's a really weird looking relationship try to come up with, a, with an explanation for that relationship, then maybe uh, split the data into two subgroups, this group with the most of the data and this subgroup with the outliers, and then analyze the data if, uh, separately. So I wouldn't use either of these correlations, I would split the data into two groups because there are clearly two subsamples in, in this data set. Here's an explanation of when you should apply each of these correlations from uh, an article published in Psychological Methods. So Psychological Methods is one of the better, or if the, not the best, uh, methods journals in social sciences. And they explain the relationship between the rank correlation and the linear correlation really well. They say that these correlations have different goals. The Linear correlation, the person correlation, is a measure of linearity between two variables, whereas the rank correlation, Spearman correlation, is a measure of their monotonicity, which means, just means that whether one is an increase in function of another one, regardless of the functional form. Importantly, this explanation says nothing about distribution. So the distribution of a variable should not be a factor when you pick your correlation. Instead, what you do is to look at the scatter plot and then look at is a line good exp uh, explanation for my data or is it just better to explain my data with a general increasing monotonic function instead of any specific functional form. So to recap, it is entirely possible to have non-normal variables like these two here that have a very different relationship when you look at the ranks and when you look at the linear correlation, so we can see that rank correlation is positive, linear correlation is negative. This probably never happens in, in real data. So uh, when you have normally distributed variables, then it's extremely unlikely that they are the rank and linear correlation would go into two different directions. And it's also possible that the Spearman correlation and the person correlation are very similar when data are non-normal. And if two correlations are very similar, then I guess it doesn't really matter which one of those similar values we report. I generally tend to go always with the linear correlation because that's more compatible with the analysis that I apply in the data in other parts of my study. So my rules of thumb. Uh, first, always choose the correlation based on a scatter plot. And, uh, it might make sense to describe normal data with rank correlation and uh, it might make sense to describe non-normal data with the linear uh, relationship. Whether the relationship is linear or not, that is what the scatter plot tells you. The distribution of the variables doesn't. If the original data and normal correlation differ a lot, report a scatter plot and interpret it. So it might indicate that there's, there are important subgroups because for normally distributed data, these correlations tend to be very similar. Now, importantly, if you use a rank correlation, you assume that it's not useful to describe your data with a line. And then that also means 
that you rule out the application of any other linear MAR description like regression analysis or factor analysis in your study. So using a rank correlation and then using a regression analysis is incorrect because you are changing your assumptions. You cannot assume that the data can be usefully described as linear and then go and do a linear description or linear analysis of the data. Either you stick to linear models or you stick to, uh, to non-linear models, but you generally shouldn't say that my variable is, non, is not usefully linear and then apply a linear model. So you don't do it like this, choosing a correlation because of skewness. Instead, you do it like this, like Vera Natunen does in her master thesis. You uh, explain the linearity assumption, then you look at the scatter plot, and then you pick your correlation based on the scatter plot. So to summarize, the normal distribution is usually of little importance. So you don't really need to care about normal distribution when you pick which statistical test you apply or how you characterize the relationship between two variables. Now we need to ask the question, is, is normality always important? Do we, do we ever have to care about normality? And the answer is, you actually do need to worry a lot about normality in certain situations. So for example, this article by, that I wrote with Cyril Amati and John Antonakis, we take a look at the random, if uh, the normality assumption in latent variable models that contain interactions. And in these models, the normality assumption that they make, which I will not explain in detail here, is critically important. If the normality assumption that these variable models make is violated, then your results will be completely untrustworthy. So normality matters when you go for very complex things, but for simple things like recursion and mean comparison, it doesn't really matter. Another thing that you need to understand is that applying, for example, latent interaction models is very complex, and that is not something that you do as a beginner. It takes a couple of years of, of practice and expertise to be able to usefully apply the models that we analyze in this paper. I'm not, I don't want to say that inspections of distribution is not useful. It is, and I look at normality of my variables individually as a standard part for my workflow. It just doesn't influence which test I apply or how I characterize relationship between two variables, but it has other uses. So uh, for example, are the outliers. If you have extreme variables in a data, then histogram or kernel density plot will show you where those extreme values are. There might be errors in the data. So um, if there's a person who reports that they are five meters tall, that's a data error, but that's impossible. There might be uh, cases that should be, not be in the population, for example, I studied, I did a survey of small software Finnish companies some years ago and I got uh, answers from Nokia, which is a large telecom com company in Finland, and they are clearly not a part of my population, but the survey was sent to them by accident. It may make sense to compare two varied distributions with medians rather than means or averages. So if your two variables are very have very different distributions and you don't have the space to plot those distributions, then looking at medians would be useful. But again, medians are tested with kruskal wallis test or man whitney test, not because the data are non-normal, but because those are appropriate tests for the median. Means are always tested with t-test regardless of the distribution. Nonlinear relationship between two variables may be a result of a nonlinear relationship. For example, if income is highly skewed, which it is, there are very few people who earn a lot and most people earn less, that indicates that there is something that produces these skewed outcomes and that might be a nonlinear process. But then again, your, the reason to model nonlinearity is not the skewness, but it is the, uh, the nonlinear process that produces that skewness. For example, uh, races that you get are 
proportional to your current salary level. So the person who has gotten more raises will uh, earn a lot more than the person who has never gotten a raise. Always look at scatter plots. That will tell you the nature of the relationship between two variables. Then finally, when using latent variable models, and I must stress that these are, uh, are advanced models that should not be applied by beginners, you will need to understand a lot more about the statistical analysis that most master's st uh, students or uh, starting doctoral students know to be able to apply these well. In this kind of models, if you have a linear latent variable model, then normality assumption is important for the validity of standard errors and some test statistics. If your data are in important ways, non-multivariate normal, then you have to apply alternative, alternative tests and alternative fit indices. Then in later inter latent interactions and mixture models, the distribution assumptions also affect how trustworthy the estimates are. And in these cases, uh, the normality assumption is not very well understood by most of the, uh, the users of these techniques and it's really assessed in applied research. But to summarize, for beginners who apply mean comparisons and regression analysis, you don't really need to care about any normality assumptions for those analyses to work.